today, and I would like to also extend a welcome to everybody with us on this call. This is a particularly exciting call for me um, because we have uh, the most uh, people from outside of the United States as contributors uh, on this call because we adjusted the time to do that. So I'm seeing these faces that I haven't seen in some cases in years and years. So um, that's a wonderful treat. So my name is Gavin Van Horn. I work for the Center for Humans and Nature. Um, check out our new website, uh, visuals. I should say it's not a brand new website, but it's the, the uh, look of it has been changed and uh, restructured. And it's, it's an exciting thing happening over at the Center for Humans and Nature. Um, I am a co-editor of this Kinship book series, which is why I'm speaking right now. Otherwise, I would just be listening. So I'm coming to you from the blossoming hills of San Luis Obispo, place of hummingbird, sage, orange poppy, serpentine rock, osprey, seasonal creeks, California newts, and an occasional Stellar's jay, the lands of the northern Chumash peoples who lived in such a way as to make this place a place of abundance. Um, I see people are already uh, introducing themselves in the chat. I would encourage you to do that. If you're on the call, just say hello and tell us where you're from. It's always fun to see where people are, are coming from. So um, I'm gonna provide just a, a short amount of framing about the series as a whole. And then we're gonna get into hearing from our contributors. They're going to read um, some short selections from Either their, uh, either their poem or their essay uh, contribution to this uh, volume, this series. And then at the end, there'll be some time, as Stephen said, to have some Q&A. So please, um, if questions arise for you, if something inspires or sparks something for you uh, from one of the readings, um, throw that in the chat. Uh, that's what it's for. And we will circle uh, back to it at the end of our meeting. So big picture speaking, um, the origins of the Kinship book series sort of had three thematic threads. Um, one was the, uh, we wanted to explore the idea of non-human personhood. Um, and I will get into that a little bit later because that's what volume four is all about, but it, this crosses the volumes. Um, some of you may be aware that uh, there are rivers and mountains and forests um, that are increasingly being recognized in uh, the legal system as having rights or as being living entities, persons that um, have standing in the courts. Um, so that's, it's an exciting development. And, but that notion of non-human personhood has been around for millennia. So that we wanted to explore that in this book series. We also wanted to explore this concept of concentric ecology which is a term that Enrique Salmon uses, um, ethnobotanist to uh, an anthropologist who contributed to the books. Concentric ecology, as you might intuit from that phrase, uh, means that as human beings dwelling in a landscape that we can actually be keystone species in that landscape among our other kin, that our, organi our, our mythologies, our stories, our narratives, our practices, our daily ways of life are organized organized around a framework in which we consider all the other beings around us relations. And so that's a concentric ecology and a lot of people in these books, um, you know, that's sort of a launching point for their thinking. And the last, um, the last major theme that threads its way throughout these books is um, that we live in a world of living subjects, not objects. Um, so, uh, Robin Wall Kimmer, who's a co-editor of the book, um, wants to create a language revolution in a way um, to change that common usage, especially in the West of calling other animals its or even plants its or other entities its, I-T-S. Instead, she suggests the word key, uh, which has uh, meaning in the Anishinaabe language as a living being. But one shorthand way of thinking about this might simply be that take a moment to consider your pronouns um, when you're thinking, talking about the world, the way that that reflects 
um, a certain cosmovision. So we wanted to, to push up against that idea that other non-human beings are its, um, if we could. So simply stated, all those things combine um, into sort of a mega theme, which is the world is alive. So how do we engage, respond, um, practice that awareness individually and collectively? Um, how do we take care in this conversation with other than human beings? And that's why um, many people involved, uh, that, or that is um, sometimes referred to as kinning, that is a word that's starting to come up again and again. The verb, the act, the practice of being and becoming kin. So the initial idea for this book series was a single volume. And obviously that's not what happened. It, it sprouted like mushrooms into uh, five distinct books that are sort of connected uh, through their underground network. I'm sure Andy might appreciate that reference. We're gonna hear from him on mushrooms a little bit later. Um, but as editors, we had to think about how we wanted to organize this material. And for us, it made the most sense to talk about it at different scales, to talk about kinning at different scales, from um, planet, the macro, to place, to partners, to persons, to practice. And so um, this fourth volume focuses on persons. And we'll hope, we hope that you can join us for our final book club event, which will be a month from now uh, in April about practice, which John, Ed, uh, John Hausdorff, our co-editor, uh, will help us uh, facilitate that meeting. And that discussion will revolve around that question of how does kinship get enacted on the ground? Um, so you can check the Point Race website to get that final date on your calendar. And one other date that I'd like to put on your calendar that just emerged uh, recently is that um, we did a radio show and podcast, the Center for Humans and Nature, with an incredible uh, show called To the Best of Our Knowledge, uh, which is co-hosted by Steve Paulson and Ann Strainchamps. And we are going to celebrate the release of that podcast radio bundle on March 30th. Uh, so stay tuned. Um, there'll be more about that uh, in the coming week or two. But it looks right now as though um, Robin uh, Kimmer and I will be um, in conversation with Stephen and Ann. So, um, so every volume of kinship is about confronting what is some kind, sometimes called the myth of separation, that we are discrete individuals without any attachments or relationships to other uh, persons. And, and so we wanted to counter that and talk about other than human persons. And for me, that word carries a double meaning in this volume. The first meaning is that personhood, as I've said, is, is more than human concept, that humans are part of a greater collective of persons. Uh, and what I mean by that is persons are those beings that display agency, that have a will to thrive, that we might say are have a certain wildness. They engage us in their sphere of influence. They have intention. And sometimes they give their attention to us. So this volume is about expanding the boundaries we might have drawn around humans as um, something that David Abram refers to as uh, uniquely unique. We're not uniquely unique. <laughs> we have these shared relationships and humans are one type of personhood among many, many kinds. And the second reason um, persons is an apt title for this volume is that our kinship relationships are personal. In fact, each of our kinships will be different. You may not feel the same way that I do about Texas horn frogs or scissor tail flycatchers or Anna's hummingbirds or box turtles or coyotes, to name just a few. And I won't feel the same way as you do about these, the species that uh, you connect most with. I might not have the same affinity that you do for a particular hidden creek or a grove of trees because I haven't had a chance to meet that creek or those trees. Um, I mean, we all might feel the same about sea otters. I mean, how could you not? But the point here is that while there is a lot that can be said about kinship that crosses over um, in these topics and relations, that kinship is ultimately built on our everyday intimacies. It's personal. 
So other persons become persons to us over time. And I would hazard a guess to say that it works in the other direction as well, that we become persons to them in a manner of speaking. So volume four is about how personal kinship can be. So now I'm going to turn things over to our contributors and we're gonna hear from each of them uh, directly um, from the poem or essay they contributed to the book. And we'll do that just back to back as a kind of river of words. And um, as I said, use the chat if you um, if a question is raised for you or you have a comment you'd like to make and we'll come back to that. But now let's find out about the persons that are with us uh, today. We're gonna start with Manon Voice kicking us off. Manon, take it away. Hi everyone, it's so good to be here today. Um, this is, my name is Manon Voice. I am a poet, uh, a writer, a community builder and an educator currently living in Indianapolis, Indiana. And um, I'm very honored to have contributed the poem Clouds of Witnesses to this volume. Somewhere in the world, a child is playing outdoors again, flying a kite made from mylar, whipping against the back of the wind, held to earth by a line. Arms as poles of gravity, the body not quite a bird, the narrow limits of the eye stir the first of many magics. The sky is no longer a sky. The name we have given it disappears in a fugue of delight. The cascade of thick bodied cumulus shapeshifts into a phantasmagoria of animation. The child, pried open with curiosity, projects new inventions on the sprawling blue canvas. Laughing forth a thread of strange names, she bestows upon her novel caricatures. When the child tries to mouth this mystery, it will disembogue in an avalanche of questions peppered upon adults torn from imagination, tethered to debts. She feels their skin scales of fear and turns inward and outward, traversing a Mobius strip of Googled information fused with her own astonishment and the fire of wild interrogations. She will learn that kites were first developed in ancient China and were probably used for signal signaling at a distance. Inside, her house is in quarantine, a cloistered modern settlement of screens. Lately, she has heard the term distance as many times as she has heard the word China. But now these terms transmute into her fascination with kites. Her mind has rippled out like the wide sea of the sky. Her lungs have the breath of her new neighbors of clouds who gaily etch her future. Studious in beauty, she has become a lover of simple things. She will also learn to create new ones, new ones that lift, that fly, that transport, that help humans be held to earth by a line. Wow, that was so beautiful, Amanda, and I hesitate even to speak now. I just feel like we should linger for a moment. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Lyanda Lynn Haupt in Seattle. This is the home of the Duwamish people. The Salish Sea is right down the street here. And I am going to read to you from my piece, Starlings, Infinity, and the Kith of Kinship. So bringing that other word from the phrase kith and kin into the conversation. Where kin are relations of kind, kith is relationship based on knowledge of place, the close landscape, one's square mile where each tree and neighbor and crow and fox and stone are known, not by math or guide, but by heart. Kithship is intimacy with the landscape in which one dwells and is entangled. 
a knowing of its way marks, its fragrance, the habits of its wildlings. And although it might seem more beautiful to dwell in awareness of our kinship with all of life and to act from that center, such awareness is not required for the fact of our kinship to remain as an ecological given. Kithship is different. Kithship is hard won visceral intimacy, blood cut of the thorn, bright sting of the nettle, knowledge of the rock where the snake suns herself and the best path around them. Kithship enlivens and complexifies kinship. And it is essential if the fullness of kinship's wisdom is to be lived. The endangered orcas in the Southern waters of Scotland are my beloved kindred to be sure. I know this, I know this, even though I will likely never see them. But the Salish Sea orcas who roam the home waterways we share, I know them as individuals by the scars visible on their dorsal fins. I have seen their young breach the surface of water as I paddle in my kayak. I have watched the fountain of their exhale, the echo of their breath singing all the way to shore. I have walked home after such moments in wonder wanting never to bathe again, but to live always in a skin of orca breath. Thank you, Leander. That's very moving. Uh, I'm Andreas Weber. I am in Berlin right now on the great northern European plain. And I'm on the west side of the town close to the big forest, the Grunewald forest of oaks and pines and birch trees. And I'm sitting in my bay window with acacia and maple trees in the dark, which are always my companions when I'm at my desk. And today was the first slightly warmer day in this early spring, late winter, and I saw two um, brimstone butterflies flying about. And I sat some moments in front of the door um, of the building on the steps and um, let myself be warmed by the sun. I'm reading you um, a little um, paragraph from my essay, Skin Centric Ecology, where I am describing a, an encounter with lichens in Italy and what that did to me in terms of my understanding of myself and of myself as lichen and as stone. Metabolism is a way through which one being becomes incorporated into another, not metaphorically. Metabolism is a way stone becomes me. What in my heart felt like an exchange with plant beings and fungus beings and rock truly was this exchange. Plants transform rock and by this pathway, my body, as I subsist on plants, like all life does, transforms from rock into flesh. The same sort of transformation happens as I breathe. I breathe in the exhalations of plants and they breathe in my body whose building blocks of carbon are continuously broken down and shed through my lungs as CO2. A rock that is colonized by lichens weathers a thousand times faster than it does if it is not embraced by life. Lichens eat rock just as they eat sunlight. They transform rock into flesh. The being of their flesh and mineral being have merged. Skin is kin. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, lichen being the most stunning symbiotic community of beings. Thank you. Um, I'm Ginny Batson. I'm a walker, thinker and writer, 
not necessarily in that order. Um, I'm also a simling. I'm interested in symbioethics and making up words for new times, like simling. Um, I live about uh, two or three hundred yards from the River Wye uh, in a little town called Hereford, but I'm originally from Wales. And I've only just recently returned from thousands of wild daffodils nodding and shaking their pretty little heads, bearing witness to all that we do and say. Um, my piece is from uh, the first book, Planet, which I called Home. And because we're talking about persons today, I'm reading the little bit that honours uh, the star Asidians. There are star Asidians now under these waters, budding tunicates or sea squirts, fantastic and taxidifying. Their tunics are made from plant-like cells and they cluster together like flowers, mutualistically thriving as filter feeders. But they begin life as eggs that hatch into tadpoles with spine-like corda sessile in the water. They soon settle and grow as gelatinous flat communities no thicker than a pencil, attaching to substrate rocks, shells and even seaweeds. Each point or petal is an individual animal, a zoid, yet part of a larger colonial animal flowering around communal openings called excellent siphons. Individually, they inhale nutrients. Communally, they exhale water. Blues, greens, golds, oranges, reds, they contain both biochemical and color warning defenses to off-put predators. But they have evolved an innate immune system resembling our own dependent on powerful symbiosis with bacteria. These beings look so utterly different to humans, but remarkably, they are our closest genetic invertebrate relatives. We are gene kin, a conciliation of difference by a uniform tone. The golden light of the sun and its entropy, enthalpy, life-sustaining properties, even in the sea. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeannie. I'm, uh, hi, I'm Martin Lee Miller. Um, sorry for being late. I literally just got off a panel here at the library. I'm still at the library in Oslo, where we spoke with the community about the legacy of Arnonesis deep ecology here in Norway and particularly touched on aspects of grief but also of what could it mean to embody gestures of grim hope in this time and um, curiously we spoke a lot about the avian beings and I just want to acknowledge that, Leanda, your work on the avian beings has really profoundly enlivened my own experience of, of birds. So thank you for that. Um, but in this brief reading, I'd like to bring you into a moment of conversation with persons and more than human persons with whom my own life has been strangely entangled for the last 10, 12 years, salmon. So I read from uh, from the text. A thousand Chinook salmon, perhaps, or perhaps 10,000. They know no adequate embodied response to the dam that blocks the river. This it cannot be. It has never been piped water thunders. 10,000 incarnate river intelligences, dumbfounded. 10,000 cold blooded testimonials, testimonials that water can leap even against gravity circulating as willful body, circulating with intention across ancient migration routes, circulating as children's stories and grizzlies' winter fat. 
They have never done anything but leap against obstacles. They leap against the dam. They do not stop. Stopping is no viable body thought inside their sizzling flesh. They crush their heads trying. They color the river red with their blood. A full century passes. Every year they return. Every year they leap. Every year they crush their heads. Every year they bleed to death. The urge to leap is so powerful a thought stopping simply remains unthinkable. To ask again who we are as human beings is also to ask again who and what else participates in this biosphere's unstoppable outpouring into self-expression. Acts performed in defense of life from this point of view are concrete embodiments of life's yearning to be. They may be politically inopportune, they may be economically sidelining, they may be socially stigmatizing, they may be personally defeating, they may starve our bellies, silence our voices, drain our hearts, break our necks, but they matter. Every one of them matters. Actions that celebrate, honored, or guard life matter as an ontological manifestation of aliveness, a reorientation toward being as being and participation. And ever the salmon leap. A century came and went, the numbers collapsed. Stopping was never a viable body thought. Some old timers said the fish never stopped reminding us of our obligation to honor them. We failed them, but no longer. We're being listened to and called to. We're beginning to listen to the world again. Both dams on the river are now dismantled in what made international headlines as the world's largest dam removal anywhere ever. The salmon, within weeks of the dam removal, they leapt upriver. What else? They instantly got to business, co-creating once again a more vibrant, more intricately entangled existence. Thank you very, very much, Martin, for that extraordinarily powerful reading and the idea of water leaping against gravity, which will stay with me for quite some time. Uh, my name is Julian Hoffman, and I live in a small village high in the mountains of northern Greece above the Prespa Lakes. And this watershed where I live is shared by three countries, Greece, Albania, and North Macedonia. So my kinship connections, my relationship with persons includes the people on all three sides of what have frequently been very divisive borders. And it also includes uh, ancient junipers in the limestone mountains, and it includes brown bears in the beech woods beside my home, and it includes thousands of pelicans on the summer waters, because this place, like all places and like the world itself, is a shared place. Um, I'm going to read a short section from an essay that was in the previous volume, volume three. Uh, and it's, it's an essay about communication, but as much as, is it, as much as it is about communication, it's about the lack of communication. And it's also about the need to nurture silence in order to create a space where we can hear other voices. It's an essay about elephants and it's called A Language of Listening. We say elephants never forget, but what we mean by this is that elephants remember. They remember ancestral paths across plains that look trackless to us. They remember bevels in the earth that briefly brim. They remember seasons of hardship and seasons of prosperity. They remember where rain seeps away and where rain makes rivers. They remember each and every member of their herd or even elephants not seen for many years and elephants remember the dead. Many scientists and anthropologists believe elephants mourn their kin by ritually responding to found bones, raising their legs over them in an unusual display and tenderly touching them with their trunks, something which never occurs with the bones of other species. It is thought that the reaction to the bodies of brethren animals reveals a comprehension of mortality, a self-awareness and conscious acknowledgement of life's limited parameters, and that this grieving for the remains of others is emotional, empathic, and connective in quality. But what of piano keys? 
jewelry, furniture inlay and billiard balls, what of chess pieces and decorative figurines, carvings to enhance one's status, trophies displaced on a wall and elaborately scaled replicas of castles and sailing ships. What of pale powder mounded up in jars in a shop of traditional medicines in a Chinese city? Would elephants recognize the transfigured tusks of their kind and still touch them with their trunks? Or has ivory been so successfully shapeshifted by us that it would be alien even to those it belongs to? Between 10 and 15,000 elephants each year are purposefully killed by poachers in Africa alone, which means that there are now more bones and bodies of elephants to grieve over than ever. Far too many to forget too many to ever remember. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julian. Uh, I so enjoyed uh, reading that essay um, and it's a real privilege to hear you read an extract from it. Uh, I'm going to return to a watery theme with the poem that I'd like to share. I'm based, I'm Susan Richardson, I'm based in Wales on the west coast, the far west coast, about as far west as you can get, uh, on a cliff on the edge of the Celtic Sea. And uh, the poem that I'd like to share is called Charmed. It first appeared in my most recent poetry collection, Words the Turtle Taught Me, and uh, I'm incredibly grateful to uh, Gavin, John and Robin to have uh, wanted to reproduce it um, in this uh, gorgeous anthology. Uh, the poem um, and indeed 29 other poems grew out of a residency that I was very fortunate to have with the Marine Conservation Society and I was commissioned to write 30 poems for 30 threatened marine species, all of whom are either visitors to or resident in uh, UK waters. And this particular poem, Charmed, honours the Say Whale, which was tragically almost hunted to extinction in the 19th and 20th centuries. She calls him from a thousand miles distance, sends forth an invisible cord from her edge of cliff to his edge of existence. She calls him in autumn storms, in summer stillness, grooves a new migration route, moons him towards her for tide after tide. Some claim with disdain that she practiced with sprats. Some beg her to tame their cats or mend their lame horses. Others whisper that she's aiming to become one, then hide from her gaze, for upgrading to Rorkel takes whole shores of sorcery compared with subsiding into seal. She knows when he's close by the tingle of krill on her tongue, by the pulse of his infrasonic hum in her thighs, by the unpleating of her throat as she hazards a smile. And though she's tiring, awed by his size, she relies on no lyre to draw him, no piping raises him, swaying from the waves. And when he finally arrives, she defies the precipice, leans further, further, further over the side to tell him why she fetched him. Words stranding between them like baleen. Not to contrive more scientific lies, not for those men rubbing Krona from their eyes. But to show that my kind need not be predators for no other reason but to see. Thank you, Susan. Um, uh, incredible, thank you. Um, hello everyone, my name is Dr. Andy Letcher. I'm speaking from the United Kingdom where I'm a senior lecturer here at Schumacher College, and I run an MA master's program called Engaged Ecology, and I'm thrilled and honored to be part of this collection. I, when I get the time, I research and write about psychedelic experience, and I'm particularly interested in how 
psychedelics seem to um, uh, afford people exactly the kind of experiences that are perhaps related here. In this essay, I do a very unscholarly thing. I break the fourth wall and I talk about my own relationship with the Liberty Cap mushroom. And I'll read a paragraph for you now. For something not much bigger than your little finger, this goblin-hatted toadstool packs quite a punch. Scientific investigation, the work of Logos, or the rational mind, has revealed it to be stuffed with tryptamine alkaloids, psilocybin, psilocin, biocystin, potent psychedelics all. If you're bold enough to eat even a dozen, your world will be completely transformed. You'll be thrown headlong into that other realm, mythos. There may be ickiness at first, a feeling of nausea or vertigo, like you might faint. When it passes and you can stand again or bumble about leaden-footed, you'll see that someone's turned the dial up on all the colours. There's an ambiance of enchantment, as though you've stepped into fairy tale. The simplest of acts takes on mythic significance. And, lest you take it or yourself too seriously, the experience comes infused with such a wry and ribald levity that you're left with the distinct impression that the whole shebang began with a belch, a fart, and tears streaming down the creator's face. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Andy. Thank you for everyone. I'm really proud to be part of this. Um, Andy, you just kind of turned up the dial for me with the belch, the fart, all of that. I love it. Uh, my name is Brooke Williams. I'm in um, southern Utah. Let me just show you where I am, and then I don't have to talk about it. Um, I write some things, and I teach some, and I do conservation work. And what you're seeing out here is um, what was once hunted by Ute people and then overgrazed by um, our ancestors. And it's now kind of coming back. Um, the animals kind of move freely through the house if the doors are left open. And I saw the first Says Phoebe of the season yesterday. So I'm quite happy about that. Um, what I'm going to read is actually took place in Florida in the Ding Darling uh, National Wildlife Refuge a few years ago. Uh, it's titled Four Turtles. Three of the turtles were sitting along a large log angling out of the water. Low turtle sat on the log just above the water level. High turtle sat midway up the log with mid turtle between high turtle and low turtle. The fourth shore turtle lay in the shade covered mud on the far side of the canal. The three turtles on the angle log appeared to be sleeping. Shore turtle rose from his resting place and slowly moved toward the water. As if the sound of shore turtle entering the water were the signal, high turtle rose from the log, stood momentarily and moved up the angled log, the distance of exactly one turtle length, then lowered himself, resuming his resting position. Mid turtle then rose, moved up the log and settled into the position previously occupied by high turtle. Low turtle did the same, moving along the angled log, stopping just behind mid turtle. This created space for shore turtle, who had just arrived at the log to climb out of the water. Now, instead of three turtles asleep on the angled log, there were four. I had seen wild turtles before. More than what I saw, I felt something unnamed, yet familiar pass between those turtles. I interpreted the behavior as the polite caring of three individuals for the fourth. If this makes me guilty of anthropomorphism, attributing human behaviors and mental states to other species, so be it. 
I'm suggesting that we share consciousness with these turtles, which as a biologist, I'm not allowed to do. As humans, do we assume that because we have emotion or mental state that it's unique to us as higher beings, that other beings cannot possibly share this mental state? These emotional or mental states might not be human characteristics, but in fact may be common to all living beings. What would we call the idea that as living beings, we share many emotional and mental states with other living beings? Ecopocentrism? This is in contrast to anthropocentrism, which, remind, which regards humankind as the central and most important element of existence. Thank you, dear Brooke. Um, I love that I'm going after Brooke as another Brooke. I'm Brooke Hecht. I'm lucky enough um, to work with Gavin at the Center for Humans and Nature. And I'm lucky enough to actually be distant cousins with Brooke Williams. Um, I'm especially happy that I'm going after Brooke because um, while I normally might be frightened to go after you, Brooke, um, he did inspire this piece in many ways because it was reading um, from Brooke's work in um, Open Midnight and Conversations where Brooke kind of grabbed my mind at one point with the idea of what if our ancestors, what if our human ancestral kin are actually out there? What if they have an influence on us? Me, you know, the Western trained ecologist, rational mind. But I believed Brooke when he said this, like, wow, well, what if they, what if they are, what if they are waiting for us to um, ask for help, ask for insight? Um, the piece I'm reading from, uh, I'm thinking about my ancestors eight generations back. While most of my ancestry comes from Wales, so I love having my Welsh um, kin on with me. Um, my family, uh, many parts of my family have been here um, for uh, a long time. And these are, this is a piece about going eight generations back. And um, the ancestors that I'm thinking about and grappling with and wondering about um, how they were living in the area of South Carolina, what's now South Carolina and Charleston in 1776, but left in 1776. They left and went to what is now Natchez, Mississippi, which is very interesting to me that they were kind of like, hmm, something's afoot and we're out of here. Um, earlier on, my question was kind of like, well, which side were they on? Were on the side of the British or were they on the side of the American? Wrong question. As I later found, the answer was neither. But that also may not be the right question at all, as Brooke pointed out to me. So here I will read. Today, I reach back and call into the past to these grandparents, Stephen and Tuda, to draw them to me. Grandfather, what was your relationship with the creatures you hunted? Did you consider the furs you gathered kin or commodity? My imagination strains to picture the abundance and beauty of the living world beneath your feet in the skies above you. Grandmother, did you grow or tend medicines? What was your relationship with the plants you might have harvested? Will you guide my hands well today as I tend relationships with the plant medicines in the land to which I belong? Grandmother, what was it like to be imprisoned and far from your family? Did you consider trying to compel your son's home to secure your own release as the Spanish hoped? Or did you perhaps carry a deep sense that you could and you should withstand imprisonment so that your sons and daughters might remain with the Chickasaw? What commitments to your kin carried you through your imprisonment? How far and wide did your kinship networks extend? Grandmother, grandfather, have you been waiting for me to call into the past for help? I call to you now from the summer of 2020. I am in quasi-quarantine because of the worldwide spread of a novel coronavirus. Brianna Taylor and George, George Floyd have just been murdered. The land of your birth has long seen the injustices of colonization, structural racism, and the destruction of life for goods and services. There has been a pursuit of happiness, 
not meaning or purpose, but happiness. And this pursuit has come at great expense. Our human and more than human kin suffer the injustices of this pursuit. And my heart breaks with sorrows and regrets that stretch back through time. It stretches forward as well, knowing that unchecked climate change and the deep roots of systemic racism promise more suffering to come. Grandmother, grandfather, what kind of ancestors did you want to be? Have the past 250 years brought what you hoped for your descendants? What are your regrets and sorrows? Put the apology in my mouth, help me speak it now. Help me speak my own apologies. And please do not forget to whisper into my ears what your heart knew of the living world, the wisdom you must have carried. Do you have a vision of the ancestor I might become? Today, I too am an edge dweller between worlds. Please help lift me across the fence to the place where we humans can stand in reciprocal relationship with life, land and water, air and stone, creature and soil. Thanks, Brooke. Orion's here. And um, I sit here on the south side of Chicago. And I sit here as one of the indigenous people that were uprooted and brought into the Western Hemisphere. And as an indigenous people, we often don't know our original tribal ethnic uh, connections. But in my DNA analysis, I note Twi, I note Wolof, I note Yoruba, and our cultural connections in our community. I note that spiritual and African impulse, and I'm in recovery from all that has occurred. And also in my DNA, my Scottish great-grandmothers came to me to let me know that they were healers and that if they had their way, this thing would never have happened. And so they asked me to continue in the African tradition and in their healing tradition. And I come to you as a community architect to create communities of belonging for all beings. So from what I wrote, yet as it is sometimes said, in crisis appears opportunity. As cruel as the attempted erasure of African cultures was, this intermingling of African ways of life also opened opportunities rooted in skinship, including social and cultural concepts such as Pan-Africanism, which espouses positive Black cultural ideas and seeks to overthrow negative patterns of thought associated with Blackness. Cultural consciousness is an antidote to the destructive aspects of enslavement, oppression, and colonialism, a pathway to healing from the intergenerational traumas experienced by those identified as occupying enslaved, oppressed, or colonized classes. As a platform for social cohesion, Skinship could be critically broadened by focusing on kinship. What is apparent is that a revolution is in order and it must be waged via a campaign that is rooted in the recognition that all people are sacred beings and thus kin. Pan-African and Black consciousness movements contain nascent ideas that open fresh pathways for considering what kinship means. We can no longer afford to be in perpetual conflict with one another. It does not matter which sector is evaluated from the economy to spirituality. The divisions that perpetrate war and hate must be ended. Kinship must prevail if healing cultural and ecological trauma is a priority. Just as a lack of kinship recognition among people lead to inevitable conflict and attempts at ethnic domination. The current dominant economic system reveals a lack of kinship recognition between human and non-human worlds. This system is extractive at every level, 
perpetuating industries that mine everything from the fish in the ocean to rare earth minerals to fossil fuels, extractive social interactions in Western social systems mirror patterns of extractive practices such as mining. Moreover, extractive social interactions and extractive economies often reproduce the same negative biological, social, cultural, and psychological impacts. Thank you. Thank you, Oren. Uh, I was uh, noting just the ideas of opportunity and, and it's one that listening to you reminded me that that's kind of in somewhat, in some ways what I think the book is very much about. This idea that kinship is an opportunity to reflect on and to consider. And I think, again, as we've listened today, th these kinships are very broad. They're across um, parts of the world, they're across species, they're across people. And I think that's, that's something that's been interesting to listen to the different uh, speakers today. Um, uh, I'm David Taylor. I teach uh, sustainability and environmental humanities here on uh, Pominac or Long Island. I'm pretty far out on the East End um, and uh, it's, it's been nice being here. One of the things that uh, you'll hear about in the poem is I'll talk about spring peepers. And spring peepers are kind of the first uh, little uh, animals to let us know that spring is on the way. And just two days ago, I heard my first spring peepers of the, of, uh, the spring and kind of made me happy to hear this. So I'm gonna read my poem called Bird Song. The ride of birds in the wetlands as the sun rises above Swan Pond tells me to notice the sun rising over the dawn etched pitch pines and stretchy scarlet oaks. My coffee is all the more sharp because of the squawks of the blue jays, the northern flickers calling out, catbirds mimicking the remaining spring peepers, a Carolina wren flitting low across the yard to forest, nesting in the kayak I left out over winter. I guess it's the reason we all sing, partner, place, and communal chorus, to have one's voice fit in with more than one, and an offering song have song returned. And now in morning, it's all the clearer. When I listen intently to these morning offerings, the words in the journal on the table take wing too, call out as though morning bird song and lift from the page when I read them out loud. Hello, good morning. And I'll keep writing in song, hoping for words to take wing. Thank you so much, uh, David, for for uh, winging us in to a conclusion and of these readings. It's always nice I, I, to have things framed by poems. You know, puts us in a different headspace. I think entering in and going. Um, so we're going to take about ten, maybe fifteen minutes. Um, to talk to one another and to talk to you all uh, that are participating uh, in, as audience members uh, and in the chat. So I would like to open, I would like to openly invite you to um, ask any questions or if you have a comment for one of the authors or something inspired you from one of the readings um, that you wanna follow up on, please share that. That's more interesting to me than me having to frame some questions of conversation. But uh, while you're thinking of those things and typing away, um, I'll try to get us started at least um, by highlighting some of the, so, uh, something that, um, well, it's the title of Julian's essay actually, right? Language of listening. Uh, that's the title, right, Julian? Getting that right? Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, that's right. And, this feels like a very strong thread throughout all of the readings in some form or another that we just heard. Not just, in, in Julian's case, it's very, you know, it's specific to the way that elephants can teach us how to listen differently, the way that they listen beyond our capacity to listen with subsonic, you know, um, 
perceptions and abilities at their disposal that 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 we lack in large part although i can try to imagine myself on a wooden dance floor or something like that where i'm hearing things a little bit differently um but i want to i want us to think about that language of listening the skin is kin andreas said you know that's the skin as a as a surface of listening our capacity to listen so I guess the question I want to throw out there to you all and just anybody feel free to jump in is what ways in your life have you found into that, uh, I don't want to necessarily call it a deeper form of listening, just listening, opening perceptions up to uh, a world beyond uh, where your skin ends, you know, um, how do you, what are your practices for listening to the world that others might benefit from hearing. As, as nobody else is, is leaping in there, I'll just I'll just briefly follow up with your thoughts there, Gavin, to say that, you know, whilst writing that essay, one thing that immediately struck me was that so much or so much elephant communication is simply beyond our range of hearing and what that led me towards is when one of the world's largest well it's the world's largest land mammal if we can't understand or we can't even hear let alone begin to understand truly what is being communicated within elephant communities what does that say of our understanding with far smaller species, far more obscure species, species that keep to the margins, that aren't nearly as visible or even audible when we can hear them. And so I, you know, I wanted to play around with this idea that runs throughout much of the, the sort of the books themselves about what is silence? Because of course, when we talk about persons and personhood, and a lot of my own work is trying to find those, that nexus between humans and the more than human world, because a lot of human voices are silenced as well. And silence, therefore, is this kind of very complex space, because whilst on one hand within human communities to be silenced is a form of violent erasure, but silence can also be a space where we pay attention to those other voices as well. So there's this sort of interplay between voice and silence that I think is really, really important to kind of consider when we're engaging, not just with the wild world, but with people uh, from other places from near neighbors because there's so much that we miss when we don't listen well beautifully said julian um susan if you don't mind me getting you to jump in here um your poem is it's there's listening elements it's also about calling out to about drawing things could you say a little bit more about that yeah, absolutely. Uh, perhaps I'll just contextualize it actually a little bit and say um, that it, it came about uh, as a result of a workshop that I attended uh, on animal communication, uh, on telepathic communication with animals. And uh, I went along to this workshop with an open mind, um, didn't really know what to expect, didn't know how far I would progress with it. Uh, the two leaders of the workshop were very, very experienced animal communicators on a telepathic level. Uh, we got the opportunity to um, communicate with companion animals, as well as with a number of um, creatures in a local safari park and some wild creatures as well. Um, so that was really, I think that's, that's what gave me the idea for um, a character calling to a say whale from the side of a cliff. Um, the character that I created believes that she does have the power to to call beyond beyond the cliff and and summon the whale to her. Um, and I have to say that by the end of, of the workshop, um, I was I was amazed by the progress that a number of people, a number of participants made. Um, I had a very interesting experience whereby um, I was communicating with a companion animal, a dog, or attempting to. And uh, I think we, we were asked to telepathically question um, what this particular creature liked doing best of all. And something popped into my head, which was um, playing with ducks. 
And the owner, his, his human, the dog's human actually said, yes, that is his most favorite thing in the world. So it, I think it taught me that if I can get into a space where um, I'm very, very relaxed and there's, um, and there's peace and quiet, um, I would be able to reach across and communicate on a level that I had never really, I suppose, thought possible. But I, I think it is, a, I, I've not reached that point on very many occasions. Um, it has to be um, a particular um, environmental circumstances in terms of the peace and the quiet. Um, and my own, my own chatter, my own monkey mind needs to be silenced as well. Right. Um, and, you know, I mean, poetry is one of those ways that I think we feel our way through words into possibly that different sort of, it's almost a, a practice for, yeah. you know, that kind of communication. Um, so I'm going to ask that our um, our contributors, if you have a response to this question about listening and, and calling, to raise your hand and in the use a little hand icon, Martin. You can raise your real hand too. I see you there. So Martin, um, if you're ready, jump in. Um, in uh, in my own in my own becoming. Um, the the first beings whom I really practiced to listen to in depth were killer whales. Actually, this was um, almost 20 years ago when I spent a winter in the Arctic uh, on a small rubber boat out in the ocean. And um, every day we would be out there freezing, but trying to interpret their language, dropping in the hydrophones into the water and uh, interpreting the particular dialects and the different ways in which family pods had different variations of similar uh, musical speech. I remember one time an elderly woman walked into our science center on an island where we were based and we gave a presentation about the killer whales and towards the end she sat there with her eyes closed and she was just crying and then the room emptied itself and uh, but she stayed put on her chair and eventually approached her and I spoke with her and she said I've been living in a wooden little cabin out in the ocean all my life in Norwegian we call them rurbu. they're basically built on wooden stilts right into the water old fishermen cabins so that these bu buildings are rocked with the tides and she said every now and then I had these strange dreams of, I, there were almost hauntings or vis visitations, musical hauntings that I could never make sense of, but it felt like I was inside of them. And it wasn't until the very end of my life, she was quite old, uh, coming here that I realized all my life I have been living inside the imagination of killer whales. Because what had happened was that these whales had been singing close to land and their music was being carried through the dense medium that is water, an excellent medium for sound, just like soil, uh, Julian, uh, into these stills, the wooden stills, which then carried the sound into the sound box of her home, amplifying the sound and her thinking she was dreaming, but really waking up into the imagination of another being. And it, it seems to me that in so many ways, this kinship series is this sustained practice of gifting our attention to one another, to other folk, uh, human and more than human, and a sustained practice in listening and in bearing witness to the multiplicity of voices who are speaking with us and through us. It seems to me so many more are speaking here than the speakers on the screen, but many others are being invited and invoked and invocated as well. That's so well said, Martin. I'm gonna, I'm gonna carry that image around for a long time, this house on stilts. Um, Art Good Times had a question in the chat, but before we turn to Art, uh, Andy and, um, and Andreas have their hands up the, and then Oren actually wants to say something. So how about Andy, Andreas, and then Oren. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I love that image of gifting of attention and um, I'm a, I'm a folk musician, so I've been playing music for many, many years. And of course, I would respond to the metaphor of listening. But I think we know that the gaze is problematic. And um, there's often a power relationship who's looking. 
how are they looking that doesn't seem to it doesn't seem to work the same way with active listening we can we can zone out of what we're hearing we can't turn our ears off but we can zone out um but when we when we give our attention to our ears and when we we really listen to something there's a it's always a receptive it's always it's always a vessel so i find it a very beautiful metaphor for what we're talking about here and you ask gavin for um practical ways things we can do um well it's come up already listening to bird song and one of the things i try and do every year is try and learn a new bird song and and familiarize myself with the the soundscape and it's hard and um uh, yeah i'm still a beginner but um it, it has enriched my life by that giving of my attention to notice who lives around me and and what they might be saying Yeah, thanks for giving this uh, keyword, listen, listening. Um, I mean, it's it's actually more than just um, hearing sounds. It's it's an attitude, and it's actually the attitude of giving precedence to the other. And um, I, I would say the, the the problem of, well, let's say Western culture is that we are always talking, and and even in natural scientist mode, we are talking because we are naming um and we are we are telling scientific stories about other beings and and i mean it's it's actually the the, the basic act of decency to listen first and not start talking and i mean listening in this broad sense of of being there and giving precedence and um, I, i'd say that's that's already all the therapy um, just just let us just go and listen and wait um wait humbly what comes it's, it's it's enough for a start i'd say uh yeah hi um i first remember i think gavin when we first met um how oftentimes people think cities are just full of people and basically maybe rats but nothing else really but um but learning how to listen and understand that listening is not just with our ears and even um uh, in a house um you know with with, with two people who uh, love plants and grandkids and all that stuff right um and and learning to 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 not even worry about when something needs watering because it they tell me when they need watering um and also um as we carve out these spaces in places like chicago and i go down the street to erica allen and uh, urban growers collective and the herb patch that they have and seeing how they plant things but other things show up as well and just walk into the patch and be quiet and then begin to collect some things that speak to me and then come home and make teas from them that give me what I need at that particular time and learning how to leave other things alone. Uh, but also just trying to replicate those systems in the project we're piloting with and co-creating with a whole lot of folks uh, here in the city where we want to look at how to grow herbs and pollinators and all kinds of things and in, in systems in our and our front yards and backyards and places like that. But also even in those gatherings, noticing how many pollinators exist in a place like Chicago and spending summers uh, counting them and even noticing that houseflies <laughs> are, are pollinators, right? Uh, and, you know, like, wait a minute, I have to change my relationship with them. I don't necessarily want them in the house, but outdoors they are welcome beings a lot of listening to do yeah that's that's amazing yeah um i i uh i, I want to encourage um anybody that didn't put their hand up or um uh that is on the call here as a contributor to uh, and also for those who are uh, members of the audience go ahead and um continue that thread of listening um how you listen i was just thinking about you know 
uh, Oren, you're, you know, saying certain herbs are calling out to you. And that made me think of Andy's essay and how the mushroom it made some kind of like, I don't know, like a, like, I don't know if it was a hum, Andy, or, a, or some kind of, there was some noise associated, like a, a sound, a resonance that drew you toward that mushroom that you describe in, in your book and or in your essay. And I'm thinking then about what you said about how the, the gaze is oftentimes, uh, there's a certain, uh, I found that in my own life to be, to be sure that when I am looking and the, the language of photography is to capture an image or to, you know, there's that kind of grasping that's going on. Whereas that receptivity of listening and learning how to do that better uh, is, is so important. I don't trust myself enough to pick the right herb yet, Oren, but uh, maybe someday. Um, I see, Lyanda, you raised your hand. So why don't you go ahead and jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to sort of follow on what Oren began with the idea of delimiting the idea of listening from beings with ears that hear sound in a particular way through sound waves. And so I live here in the Pacific Northwest where the forest is constantly returning to itself before our eyes, right? The great Western Red Cedar is just down. I'm, I'm in urban West Seattle and down the street there are old, you know, 200 year old Red Cedars lying on the earth, changing into, in front of my eyes, the red soil that I, I'm walking upon. And so you asked for a practice, Gavin, and I, I think this draws on, um, we've talked about skin and sort of the flimsiness of the husk of our skins. Manon spoke about shape shifting and that idea of being able to enter maybe into this, this uh, kindred world. My practice is walking to the forest near my home and lying um, with as little between myself and the mossy husk of a tree that's lying on the forest floor lying there for as long as it takes to feel that sense of the rhizome starting to, you know, nibble into my skin as eventually <laughs> they're all going to swallow me whole, right, at some point. Um, so what that invites for me is this sense of being in this great continuum where when I'm not there and when any of us are not there with our ears, there still exists this hum, this um, crinkling world there is we walk in a world of sound a world of listening that oftentimes has nothing to do with ears yeah. uh, so true oh um i want to um like i said just if you have more thoughts on the listening throw it and throw it in the chat or raise your hand again so i can uh see you um but uh, i do want to honor that art uh, good time to ask a question specifically um, of Jenny, and she, he said, Jenny, can you speak a bit more to uh, why you invented the neologism Nagorosphere? So maybe you can help us out with that, Jenny. Well, thank you for the question. Um, actually, there is a bit of a, a link between what we were just discussing and thinking about the Nagorosphere, because I have um, I've developed a philosophy of what I call a philosophy of love, flow and ecology, which is based on the idea or the kind of, um, <sighs> unending flow of both material matter, because it does matter, but also of the energy of thought and emotion, memory and imagination um, be beyond human uh, in, within us as what I call a simling, so as simlings among simlings, as symbiotic beings, um, but then extended towards the whole community. So, I thought about how within this philosophy, which I call fluminism, how say if I wanted to engage with, you know, with a, a full consciousness of um, being in that community, in that full sense of kinship, um, what else is going on? It's not just, I mean, there's all of our senses. I'm a slightly deaf, so I can't, 
I can't, I can't rely totally on my hearing, sadly, but I have other senses that I can engage. I also have my memory. And I think um, all beings have memory. All beings have an imagination. And I think there's this essential flow of matter and energy and imagination that is constantly going on and has been since the beginning of time. Um, and it's around us now as we live and breathe. We're breathing things in, we're breathing things out. We're, it's as if we're swimming uh, in life. Things that, you know, we're, we're exchanging genetic material even as we sit here and we don't. <laughs> um, and so I was thinking, how can I engage people with the idea of this constant flow of matter and energy and, and thought and imagination and memory and community belonging? And so I thought, well, it's a bit like a marketplace. So I thought of looking at uh, the way this is constantly in exchange. So I, I just thought to, to look at, you know, I'm, I was born, sadly, speaking English. I wish I... <laughs> She could speak lots of different languages. So I looked to the roots of my English words and I found um, Agora. Uh, I also looked at the work of um, Murray Butchin and the idea of community exchange and the importance of that, of a place where exchange happens. And so I, I just thought, well, it's like as if it's a sphere, but obviously, because it's um, it's the whole of Earth uh, as a sphere. So I just came up with the idea of nature in exchange in a sphere, in the Gora sphere. <laughs> um, but it is so much more than, than 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 just you know a visible thing. It's it's all the senses. It's all them, all our memories all our imaginations and and there is a physical matter as well that we can't see and perhaps we can't sense other siblings might be able to sense we can watch them sensing or we can feel them sensing we can imagine them sensing so anyway this is this is my answer <laughs> thank you <laughs> i hope that helps yeah thank you jimmy we um Somebody, um, Rochelle posted uh, your a link to your website, I believe, so that people can dive into Season of Light um, and find out more information about <laughs> your use of language. Um, yeah, um, language that goes beyond words. Um, I think that's a huge part of these um, of these volumes. Um, I know we're we've kind of reach time here you obviously i look at the faces of the people here i could spend you know as long as anyone was willing to put up with me um being with you all um i realized that um brooke the two brooks have been silent and manon has been silent so i do want to give you an opportunity if you want to jump in here with the last um word or a final thought or something that stood out to you uh, during the course of what we've been discussing, or maybe from a reading, or you can say, "No, thank you. I prefer to be silent and then practice silence." <laughs> I I think Brooke, you're talking, but you're uh, you're muted. It seems very unfortunate. Um. So th I think this this works both ways in terms of. We've talked about all these different ways that of listening and sensing and uh, these different ways of communicating. And I think about my animals that I live with, these two, three cats and this dog. And uh, like today I had to take them because I'm leaving town. I had to put them in their crates and take them to be to board them because they can't go with me and they can't stay here. And I realized after doing this so many times that I really have to be careful about how much information I give them before I do this, because if they know, they somehow know what I'm doing and they sense it. And, um, 
if I'm too like conniving or planning or whatever, they get it and they disappear under the bed or somewhere I can't ever find them. And I've, I've had to like miss trips before because I couldn't find my cats because they knew something was going on. And every time it happens, I realize how much I'm missing that um, in communication. I, you, you know, we take for granted that what um, we hear and what we see and what we touch is all there is. But when you live with animals, you realize there's a lot more going on and it's already been brought up about plants and things. So, I mean, I think about that all the time. Right. Brooke Heck, do you want to jump in? Okay. Um, well, I was just thinking, Manon, and was there one other person um, who didn't speak? But I, I, from my um, perspective, I think I just want to share that I just want to visit everybody. I want to come and visit and see what you're doing and lie by the trees you're with and all of these things. Um, Oren, you are close by. I feel like maybe I could, uh, I don't know, invite myself. That's terrible. Um, but invite myself to go explore and invite you up to, to where we are. I would really, really love that. I just will sort of hold that as a hope out there. Um, anyway, that's what I've been thinking. I've been thinking, I want to see everybody, um, and be with you all. And, um, last, I just want to say, thank you so much. Just, um, with Gavin and on behalf of the center, we're so thrilled to do this event with all of you. And we're, we love our partners at Point Reyes Books. We exist for our amazing contributors, all of you, your writing, your poetry, your words. Um, that's, that's why we're here. So it's just an honor to, to be with you all today. Thank you, Brooke. Manon, if you're still with us, we'd love to see your face again. Um, and uh, if you want to add anything, um, if not, then, or if you stepped away and gone to get some coffee or something, then I will wrap us up. There you are. <laughs> are you on mute yeah. though? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it, it, um, it has been so, so delightful to hear from everyone. Um, and I love Gavin, um, something that I wrote down that you said, uh, is kinship is built on every day intimacies. Um, and so just hearing all of the various art, uh, articulations um, of kinship happening right outside of our doors. Um, and that when I was growing up, you know, I live in a region that is very flat. Um, and so, uh, and I also grew up in the city. And so, you know, I wrote this poem about this young girl who just had the sky, right? Um, but she enters into a, a relationship with the sky um, and she is transmogrified by just the gazing and flying uh, a kite. And so that was just something that was accessible and right outside of her um, door. And so it can just be something like, um, yeah, like it, how, you know, how simple uh, it, you know, it, can be it can be the sky it can be the daffodils that are um growing uh along the pond that i walk by and so that i don't have to go far uh to enter into relationship with you know non-human beings but it can just be what's happening right outside of my door that i can start close in with what is nigh. And so um, I think that is what I'm taking away. And uh, I'm just so thankful um, for everyone's profound articulation on that. Beautiful. That's a wonderful uh, way to land us, Manon. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's the, the, the next breath. That's how close it is to us, our kinship. Um, so, Thank you all very much for being here um, and for spending some time uh, with us in this conversation among our kin. And um, I wish that I wish for you today that uh, maybe the sun shines a little brighter and your flesh sizzles a little bit uh, 
with, <laughs> with more sizzle as Martin talks about the 10,000 river intelligences circulating. Um, I hope you feel that today a little bit more deeply. Thank you all for being here and being with us. <laughs>